panel uh, is titled, Legal Academics Engage the Global War on Terror, Counselors, Advocates, Critics, and Theorists. Uh, my name is Avi Cover. I teach here at the law school in the clinic, uh, so I am an advocate uh, very much. And I'm um, delighted to have three panelists here to lead this discussion. Uh, we have Professor David Abraham from the University of Miami School of Law, Professor Joseph Margulies, Clinical Professor of Law and Assistant Director of the MacArthur Justice Center at Northwestern Law School, and our own Professor Michael Scharf, John Deaver, Drinko Baker, and Hostetler Pro Professor of Law and Director of the Frederick K. Cox International Law Center here at Case. Um, so needless to say, the, the, the title of this panel is, is a, a aptly descriptive one. Uh, academics, uh, legal academics, have indeed engaged the global war on terror. Uh, as has been mentioned uh, by a number of earlier panelists, uh, it has been legal academics who have been uh, at the forefront, uh, and indeed have been the architects of some of the government's global war on terror policies. Uh, they've either came out of academia into government and have returned to academia, or in some cases now hold uh, uh, judgeships and other positions in government. Uh, similarly, on the other side, it has been legal academics, some of whom are, are seated here, uh, who have led the assault uh, on that legal architecture, uh, both in the courts, uh, but also through criticism uh, and through advising. Um, and so I'm very pleased to open uh, the forum first to Professor Scharf. Well, thank you very much, Avi. So on the eve of 9-11, I had been asked by the American Journal of International Law to do a book review of a book called Rebels with a Cause. And it's a book by Nicholas Kittry that explains why people become terrorists, why people follow terrorists, and why the terrorists attack the United States and our allies. This was in page proofs on 9-11. 9-11 occurs, and by the time I got home and, and kind of got myself back together, I saw that there was an email from the American Journal saying, Michael, we want you to take your book review and update it now that 9-11 has occurred so that it is an important editorial about how the United States should respond to this attack in the context of what we've learned from Professor Kittry's book. So I, I spent that night doing that. They wanted it very quickly. And while I was doing it, George Bush came on TV. He was at the United Nations. He gave a speech called the Why Do They Hate Us speech. And he said, why do they hate us? They hate our freedom. They hate the fact that we are free and that we're democratic. And they can't tolerate living with us for that reason. And that's why they attacked us. And I sat there and I said, well, that's not at all what this 400-page book has explained. And it's meticulously researched. There were a lot of reasons they hated us. So I ended up writing this book review. And I'm going to read a couple excerpts from it. I was telling Bob Strassfeld yesterday, wow, um, I, I didn't pull my punches back then as much as maybe I do now. I've, I've become a little bit more um, cautious, maybe, in my writing. And it may be because of what has happened to academics in the last 10 years. But let me read some of these things. You'll, you'll, you may say, wow, Sharf's such an extremist. Um, <laughs> I, everybody has a copy of this, and I'll, I'll get you guys a copy too, um, but I just passed them out there. Uh, it starts out, I said, the war on terrorism will perhaps prove to be the most vexing foreign policy challenge during the early years of the new millennium. Guess what? I was wrong about that. It's going to be the most vexing challenge for the foreseeable future, not just the first couple of years. But I, I had that right, that it was going to be a big deal. Later, I say, in the modern war on, against terrorism, the defining characteristic appears to be support for any regime, no matter how undemocratic or repressive, that will side with the United States against Al Qaeda, the Taliban, and other terrorist supporting governments designated by President Bush as the axis of evil. And I was very concerned about the fact that we were going to be putting ourselves in bed with the very things, the very countries, the very repressive regimes that helped provoke terrorism. Later, I, I say that hunting down terrorist leaders and assassinating them outside the battlefield would be perceived as stooping to the level of the terrorists, and it would undercut the principle of terrorism, that terrorism is a matter of illegitimate methods, not just purposes. One of the striking messages of Kittry's book is that the fight against terrorism cannot be won without acknowledging its roots, for we overlook at our peril that those these are rebels with a cause, 
to quote the title of the book. So I, I was basically saying, I think they're going to start assassinating terrorists. I had no idea that we were going to get drunk on these predator drones and start using them left and right, as both the Bush administration and even more so the Obama administration have done. I, I definitely didn't foresee the successful operation, I guess, against Osama bin Laden. But I was concerned that these assassinations all over the world were going to change things and make us look less law-abiding. Um, then I say, in the aftermath of September 11th, Americans asked, why do they hate us? The Bush administration answered that they hate our freedom, they are evil, and they are mad. President Bush told the United Nations that we face enemies that hate not our policies, but our existence, the tolerance of openness and creative culture that defines us. And I go on to say, rebels with a cause exposes the fallacy of this statement. Opponents of the United States who resort to terrorism do not hate America's freedom. They hate America's policies and those of the regimes that we support. And, and that's really something that academics and even figures that are musicians can't say. Do you know that this week, Tony Bennett gave a speech in which he said, I'm a little worried about 9-11 because in a way we started it by bombing them first. And critics came out of the woodwork against Tony Bennett, who is not a foreign policy expert, saying, how undemocratic, how un-American of you to say. But guess what? Tony Bennett was not completely wrong. The things that we do around the world, we reap what we sow. And that's something that we're afraid to admit in our fight against terrorism. And we're fighting it in a way that is, I'm afraid, going to cause more problems for us in the future. Uh, later, I say, in prosecuting those who engage in politically motivated violence, Kittry stresses the importance of acting in accordance with international law. It is with respect to this aspect of the war on terrorism that the Bush administration received its, its lowest marks. I had no idea at the time that we were going to be seeing, three years later, the release of the White House torture memos. So I was a bit prescient, uh, maybe hard hitting. But when I wrote these things, I gave it to some editors and some other experts to look at. And they said, oh, Sharf, Sharf, you don't want to publish this. You've got to go back and tone it down. Because after all, Lynn Cheney, has just created the modern McCarthy blacklist. Do you guys remember this? Right after 9-11, I'm reading this from uh, the Washington Post right after September 11. Um, the American Council of Trustees and Alumni, a Washington-based group that's headed by the Vice President's wife, Lynn Cheney, has created a report called Defending Civilization, How Our Universities Are Failing America. And it says in this report that colleges and university faculty have been the weak link in America's response to September 11th. It asserts that, quote, when a nation's intellectuals are unwilling to defend its civilization, they give comfort to its ad adversaries. And then it lists 40 professors. It outs 40 professors who are undemocratic. And they said, do you want to be added to that list? And I said, look, I'm just going to publish it as it is. Now, they didn't continue this list, so I, I never got added to the list. Um, I don't know what the effect would have been, but I can tell you that this has a chilling effect in academia. And I don't think I would have written the same piece today quite with the same words that I used back then. But I really believed them, and I'm glad that I did. Now, in the years since 9-11, at this law school, we have been very interested in taking the challenge of keeping our, you know, speaking law to power, of telling our government that when you go too far, the academic community is watching. And we do this by hosting a series of very stimulating international conferences like today's event and publishing them in our Journal of International Law like we will uh, the papers from this and some of the other papers. For example, right after 9-11, we had a conference on terrorism on trial that looked at how is the best way to approach uh, terrorist actors, looked at the military commissions, and it critiqued them. Then we had one on rebuilding nation building, which looked at what we're doing in Afghanistan and Iraq and asked, you know, is there a better approach to this? Then our, our most important one ever and our thickest one was torture in the war on terror, where we took on the recently released White House torture memos. We had one on sacred violence, religion, and terror, looking at the interesting links between religious groups and terror and those that are, um, you know, the, the myths about maybe the clash of civilizations as a reason why we're experiencing so much terrorism. We had our um, 
Conference on Divided Loyalties, which Bob organized, and the, there's still some free uh, copies of this outside, I noticed. Uh, we had one on combating terrorist financing that Richard Gordon in the back row organized. Wake up, Richard, I'm talking about you. <laughs> and we had one on security detention, which is basically, even if we don't prosecute people at Guantanamo, even if we don't prosecute them in our courts, we're gonna keep them in jail in Guantanamo or in Bagram Air Force Base or at a black site for the rest of their lives. And we had a whole conference and an experts meeting looking at what the ramifications are and the legality of that. Then we had an optimistic one called After Guantanamo because the president promised to shut down Guantanamo. We wanted to look at what his options were. Well, this one I guess we could throw out. <laughs> And then just last fall, we had a conference on lawfare. And a big part of the conference on lawfare is about how people who see our intellectual exercise as a threat to the government and therefore say that we are illegitimate. These are people like, um, and I think you'll hear more about this in the other panelists, and I'm just wrapping up, but people like members of the Bush administration who said that if you are a law firm that represents the Guantanamo Bay inmates in habeas challenges, they say to the companies of the world, you ought to think about who else your law, you know, what your law firm is doing. Do you really want to be associated with an undemocratic, unpatriotic law firm? And basically suggested that they ought to take their business out elsewhere because lawyers, as well as academics, have been doing what lawyers are supposed to do. So I guess uh, I'm, I'm happy, Avi, to rise to the challenge to start this panel off with some provocative thinking about what is the role of the academy when you face something as extreme as 9-11. And I want to conclude with remarks from the very famous Academy Award winning movie, Judgment at Nuremberg. The movie is about the judge's trial, but it was written during the McCarthy era. And there's a speech that the chief judge gives at the end of the trial where he's explaining why it's important to hold these people responsible. He could very well be making the speech about the authors of the White House torture um, memos. He says, this is Spencer Tracy. I'll do a Spencer Tracy accent. He says, well, there are those two in our country who think that we must do what is expedient to turn the other way to do what is necessary when our country's security is at risk. But a country is not just a rock. It's not just an extension of oneself. A country is what it stands for. It's what it stands for when standing for something is the most difficult. Thank you. Gracious. Um, hello, I'm Joe Margulies. Uh, I cannot tell you how pleased I am to be here and how gratified I am to be part of this. I found the talks this morning to be uh, extraordinarily helpful to me in my own thinking and in my work. Um, I think it is, it is sometimes customary that uh, academics need not uh, acknowledge a bias perhaps because of the belief that they, they haven't won. Uh, I have won and think it's probably appropriate to declare it. Um, I am, in addition to a, a person who writes about these things, I am a, a, a litigator uh, at Northwestern University Law School. And there's been a great deal of discussion uh, in, in Michael's talk and in uh, Professor Nelson's talk and in some other talks they mentioned it about the torture memos and so on. Uh, I have represented folks at Guantanamo since the memory of man runneth not. I mean, the, the, the Guantanamo opened in January of 2002, and we filed the first litigation challenging uh, Guantanamo in February of 2002. I'm, 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 I'm very proud to say that, that though he was only a law student at the time, Professor Cover was my, uh, uh, one of my research assistants working with me uh, when we wrote the litigation in Rasul, or what became Rasul. Um, and today I represent the fellow for whose interrogation the torture memos were written. The torture memos are not just a document. Uh, they're not just a piece of paper that purport to justify uh, certain behavior. They were written to authorize the interrogation of a particular person, a person who has a name, a person who is a real human being. And all we remember now is that John Yu wrote them. Uh, but they were written to authorize the interrogation of a man named Abu Zubaydah, who is my client. 
uh, and who I will go again visit uh, the end of October. Uh, and I am one of the few people in the world who actually know what happened to Abu Zubaydah and what was done to him uh, pursuant to the torture memos, or as authorized by the torture memos. Uh, I, I know in the way that one can know only from listening to the person to whom it has happened what it means to have been uh, waterboarded 83 times in the month of August 2002 alone. I can't tell you, however, what was done to him, because apart from facts like that, which have been disclo disclosed in other documents, uh, the facts of his uh, torture uh, are not public. I know them, uh, or at least I know them as related to me, um, but you cannot know them. And uh, I will say, apropos of this conversation or our discussion today, there's been a great deal of discussion about chilling of academics and, and academics pulling their punches and maybe saying something that they would have they said early in the game that they didn't say later. Um, uh, uh, that's a very unfortunate thing, uh, very unfortunate. Uh, uh, but I have to say, I have not experienced that at all. Uh, when I was when we filed this litigation, and it got underway. At the time, I wasn't yet in academia, but, but I joined academia in January of 2004 when Rasul was in the Supreme Court. It was at the, at the, at the peak of when things were uh, oh, controversial. Um, when, when we filed it in February of 2002, my co-counsel, who at that time was based in New Orleans, uh, and his name, like my name, appeared in the paper as counsel in this case, received a death threat at home uh, in the middle of the night. And he wasn't there, and it was, it was very disturbing to his wife that, that he should have the temerity to do this. Uh, I, I have to say, I've never received anything like that. People ask me, you know, gosh, you're putting yourself out there. Eh, it's, that's, that's, you know, none of us, we're not putting ourselves out there. Now, we don't endure anything compared to our clients. And it seems to me it behooves us to remember that those are the people who are suffering, not us. Um, I don't want to talk about my cases, however. I want to talk about, uh, I want to talk about the law. I am working on a book uh, on the effect of 9-11 on uh, American national identity. And a uh, central relevance to this debate is uh, this thing we call the law. And I put it that way because um, uh, the, the whole point that I want to talk about is that this is a very elastic, malleable concept that people can invoke opportunistically uh, with different meanings to achieve different results in their, in their polemical speech. Um, I'm glad that Bob started off our remarks this morning with an acknowledgement. I don't exactly sure why it's the case, but there's an acknowledgement that uh, the, the whole post 9-11 world has been an implication of or challenge to the ideal of the law. I'm not exactly sure why that's the case, but yet it is. And we all seem to, I've got to work on more why we feel that's true, but there's definitely that sense, right? Guantanamo is, was attacked as a prison beyond the law. And Eric Lichtblau of the, uh, the New York Times writes this book called Bush's Law. And we talk about the warrantless wiretapping program, or uh, I think it was Professor Nelson who talked about the warrantless seizure of um, uh, computers. And we talk about, and of course, by putting the word warrantless before it, what we really mean is that it's not legitimated by law. It doesn't, it doesn't have the imprimatur of law. Um, of course, we talk at length about the torture memos, which we take as, as a misuse of law. That is, it cloaks that which is inherently uh, um, uh, contrary to the ideals of a civilized society in the very legalistic, uh, footnote-laden jargon of the law to purport to, to give legitimacy to that which is inherently illegitimate. And of course, we've, we've talked about the, the, the very serious profiling of communities of color that are going on, uh, which again, have the imprimatur of law. So we somehow perceive post 9-11 events as, an, as, an, as a challenge to or as an invocation to the law. And so I want to talk about this. I want to talk about the rule of law and how we come to be where we're at. No question, the rule of law is the if it's not the preeminent, it certainly vies for the title as one of the preeminent symbols of national legitimacy. I am working on an article now. I have actually am in the course of reviewing over 1,000 just uses of the term rule of law by post-war presidents uh, from Truman to Obama. Just when they use the words rule of law, what do they mean? 
uh, and there's about 1,300 examples of it that I've found. Uh, and, 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 and more than anything else, what it means is, what it is taken to mean is, hooray for us. We believe in the rule of law. It's not explicated. It is mostly meant to, as A, a symbol of national identity. It is a, a ticker of the things that we believe in. We believe in liberty, equality, and the rule of law. We believe in liberty, the rule of law, and limited government. We believe in rule of law and the rights of man. So it's just one of the things that you universally tick off. No statement of national identity is complete without uh, a pain to the rule of law. Or it is used as a symbol that demarcates us from them. We believe in the rule of law. They do not. We are good because we believe in the rule of law. They are bad because they do not. But very little explication or a symbol that unites the West. We and those like us believe in the rule of law. Those people are bad, whether it's you know communism or totalitarianism or uh, subsequently, they're bad because they do not. But what does that mean? Well, of course, that's almost never given a definition. The classic understanding is of the rule of law is as a restraint on the state. It is a restraint on and prevention of a bulwark against arbitrary uh, state power. That understanding of the rule of law uh, is older than uh, the modern world. It dates back at least to Aristotle. Um, and there is an understanding that the purpose of that restraint is to guarantee individual liberty. That is a more modern understanding. That's the understanding in which Professor Nelson used it today. That, I think, is the understanding in which Professor Scharf uses it. It's the purpose is to guarantee individual liberty. The reason we restrain the state is to provide for the, uh, an individual to exercise uh, the liberty that he has as a member of the community. But I want to suggest to you, and this is the real thing that I have found, existing alongside that understanding, that very fundamental understanding, deeply rooted in American culture, deeply rooted in American society, uh, just, just the, the, you, certainly in law school, everybody knows, I'm going to quiz you, where does this come from? Uh, a, a nation of laws and not of men, where does that come? Nobody knows. Everybody right? Everybody recognizes it, but where does it come from? Nobody can remember. All right, guys, you're smiling. Can you tell us where it comes from? Well, that's one place you find it. And before that, it's in the Federalist Papers, too. But in any event, so existing alongside that understanding that began in the mid-60s, the first reference I can see to this is late 1965, when the Johnson administration was beginning to respond to the Goldwater Rule uh, Law and Order campaign the unsuccessful 1964 campaign and the rise in, or the perceived rise in violent crime, they began to use the rule of law to mean something else. And they started to use the rule of law to mean the duty to be lawful, the duty to obey the law. The rule of law came to mean the rule by law. It was not a protection from the state, it was a protection by the state from the depredations of lawlessness. The rule of law was invoked to describe what we must do to ensure the safety of the community. And this accelerated, it was modest, it was tepid, it was hesitant during the Johnson administration. It accelerated during the Nixon years, which explicitly ran on a law and order campaign, went through a hiatus during the Carter years, uh, but accelerated dramatically during the Reagan administration where the rule of law came to be used opportunistically to mean the rule by law. That is, it is what you would do to protect the community from lawlessness. It was not a protection from the state. It was a protection by the state of lawless elements. And as part of the rule of law, one thing that developed and that everyone will recognize, one thing that developed at the same time is a suspicion that the law was too lenient, that the law as meted out by liberal judges and pointy-headed academics um, uh, was more interested in protecting the rights of criminals than the safety of the community. And that was perceived, while it formerly could invoke the great language of the rule of law as a protection against the state, that was now perceived as a, a, an abomination of the rule of law, a perversion of the rule of law, because it threatened the community. Well, I'm racing through this rather quickly because I want to 
because I agree with what David said, that the most important thing is that we get um, uh, comments here. But that's the connection to the post-9-11 world that I want to come back to. Because if you think that the rule of law is a protection against lawlessness, and when you can invoke the rule of law to protect against those who imperil the community, then you can invoke the rule of law opportunistically, selectively, to demonize those who engage the law to prevent the state from taking actions against perceived lawbreakers. And that's the connection to the lawfare debate. In other words, the idea is the reason we have the lawfare debate is that this is an extension of the idea that those who use the law to thwart the state's efforts at ensuring law and order are acting inimically to the interests of the state. And it, those who, for instance, use the law to activist judges who free people on technicalities. That's the, that's the predecessor to the lawfare uh, dialogue. The lawfare dialogue is simply an application that when we are most extreme in our need for order, those who invoke the law to challenge that need are acting inconsistent with the needs of the state. And therefore, as Michael described, you are aiding and abetting the enemy. And that's just an accelerated, intensified uh, vision of, the, of, a, of, a, of a language about law that started in... Uh, really got underway at its most accelerated form in the Reagan administration. So how does that apply to the post 9-11 policies? I think that, and I'm, I'm, I'm still working through this and I, I don't want to make it sound like I've thought this through as, much, as carefully as it may seem. I think the early understanding of the post 9-11 policy was to invoke the classic understanding of the rule of law. That's why you saw a lot of the attacks on Guantanamo. There was a perception that it was lawless. There was a perception that yeah, these attacks on the unilateral, or, or the unilateral government or the, or the unitary um, executive branch, right? There was a perception that, he was, that, the, that the executive branch was acting in a lawless way. It wasn't subjecting itself to check. Uh, it, wasn't, it was resisting check by its secrecy, by its commitment to uh, exclude Congress, by its commitment to exclude the judiciary. That invokes fears of the classic, under, that invokes the classic understanding of the rule of law and fears that this is a state run amok. And that's what explains the early narrative that got behind cases like Rasul, the Guantanamo cases, and, and the warrantless wiretap. That's what explains the narrative that led to uh, the groundswell in opposition to Bush, Bush policies that forced them to be ratcheted back. But I think in the modern understanding, the reason you see, the reason there is no discussion about this New York Times article, why, and, and the reason in response to this gentleman's question, the very first question that started this whole discussion, why aren't people protesting in the streets? It's because that understanding of the rule of law as a restraint on the state is no longer a powerful one once the state appears to have been brought back within the rule of law. And so once Rasul is a victory and you've got courts um, coordinating and overseeing what happens in Guantanamo, we figure the rule of law has been vindicated. There's no, we don't have to worry about it anymore. And now the, the, the concern for the rule of law is that we monitor, surveil, protect from protect ourselves from the lawless elements. It's that understanding of the rule of law. So we don't care about the, the monitoring and the surveillance of the uh, Muslim American and Arab American community because that's what we do. That's what the rule of law has come to mean. The same way we, used, we have done it with sex offender communities and juvenile predator communities and uh, uh, felon, uh, felons who are released from, right? Once you identify that community as those who prey on the rule of law, Surveilling them is what the rule of law has come to mean. So as long as you bring the state between, within some broad restraint, what we're doing now is consistent with the new rule of law. And where that leaves us, I don't know, but I am not at all sanguine in the immediate term. And on that cheery note, I will stop. <laughs> I'm going to turn to uh, some of the 
themes uh, that uh, we heard about at the lunch talk. Uh, what's going on on campuses and in law schools specifically? Uh, given the hundreds of thousands who have died and the millions who have been displaced around the world since 9-11 uh, um, and the war on terror, the, the resistance or pushback on campuses in the United States among both professors and students has been minimal. Few campus connections have been drawn between the post 9-11 wars and the decline of American power on the one hand and the erosion in the standard of living of American working people and middle class people as well. The self-congratulatory wave unleashed by the end of the Soviet Union in 1990 has proven short-lived. Um, a nearly um, hegemonic uh, liberalism, uh, neoliberalism, has uh, collapsed in the wake of financial crises in the rest, I should say, however, continues to live in the law schools in the form of the uh, uh, high status and continued high demand for people who do law and economics, uh, who uh, envision commodification and consumer models as a way to run law schools and to educate people and uh, going back again to one of the things that uh, Carrie Nelson said at lunch, the virtual disappearance uh, from the law school scene of uh, the Du Boisian commitment that education turns mechanics into men and not men into mechanics. Um, so um, that, that, has, that has stayed with us. Uh, there has been no uh, broader politics emerging from the law schools and law faculties uh, to uh, help guide the discussion uh, that uh, we ought to be having in the face of both declining American uh, worldwide power and uh, economy. This disappointments of the last three years, I might add, suggest that a specific imperial political economy cannot be wished away. Uh, it cannot be um, uh, simply uh, put under the categories of hope and change, but without a fundamental uh, consideration of the na national and international political economy that underlies it. Ironically, so little is happening on these campuses and at law schools precisely when, at a time when my generation and the generation of a number of people uh, on the program today, the generation of 68 of the generation of Vietnam, holds sway in faculties. We are not um, uh, as was the case in the early 50s, uh, a small number of people with politically dubious credentials uh, lodged in academia. Um, uh, to the extent that the uh, uh, radicalism of 68 found uh, uh, vocation and uh, occupation, it was indeed in academia. So it's us, it's not, um, not us. Um, so, um, the Case Institute uh, for Global Security Law and Policy is an exception. Uh, for the most part, American legal academia, uh, compared to uh, European and others, has not developed a direct critical analysis of the post-9-11 world, nor with some exceptions, uh, like Joe Margolis, like David Cole, like Michael Scharf, have academics led the way in lawsuits particularly. A number of them indulged themselves uh, in writing constitutions, first for Eastern Europe, then for Iraq, and places uh, like that, uh, at least as many probably uh, in that industry. Uh, what has happened, and what I want to spend a few minutes elaborating on, uh, has been the emergence or transformation of certain fields of study uh, in the law school uh, arena. Uh, let me first uh, indicate uh, four of them. Uh, I'm not saying this is exhausted, but let me mention four of them and then I'll come back and say a bit uh, more in detail about each of them. First, um, the rediscovery, or in some cases, uh, the discovery of, uh, of Carl Schmitt and uh, the Hobbesian uh, dilemma or the Hobbesian world. Um, as someone who worked 
for, has worked for many, many years in German history. I can say that if you wanted to take out something by or about Carl Schmidt from the library, you would have to blow the dust off many inches of dust off the shelves to find it, uh, beginning um, with, um, well, I think in the popular view, once President Bush stumbled upon the, for him, neologism of the decider, uh, Schmidt was, Schmidt was back, and, um, and it hasn't left. Uh, the friend-foe model of the world, uh, the, the conception that, um, that danger, chaos is lurking, that Hobbes' problem has not been resolved. Uh, if one looks at SSRN postings, where legal academics post their work pre-publication, uh, the proliferation in the area of constitutional law, international law, and even well beyond uh, the expansion of, of uh, an explosion of books uh, uh, on uh, Schmidt and Schmittian questions, uh, courses that uh, take it up. Uh, there's been a, an extraordinary growth uh, in this area. Um, what I have not yet seen, uh, if I may uh, advert to the question of the rule of law, uh, not yet seen is a rediscovery of Ernst Frankel, who, writing in the same period, talked about the dual state, where the rule of law is bifurcated into the normal and the existential, and the, uh, the existential um, uh, expands and uh, slowly but surely takes over more and more areas uh, of the law. So. Um, uh, the rediscovery of, of Carl Schmidt raised the question of who is the decider. It's the executive who protects the Constitution, if necessary, protects the Constitution from itself by limiting liberties in the name of survival so that when the emergency is over, uh, we can go back to the normal. But of course, it's that same executive who decides when there is an emergency. I, I don't want to... Uh, you know, try to uh, 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 suggest that um, uh, you et al. Um, were, were fervid uh, devotees of Schmidt. They may have merely replicated uh, some of it, but the, the, the model of, um, of Patriot Act expansion of extra um, constitutional forms for preserving a state, a society, under immediate threat, uh, even the way it was passed, as you may recall, uh, 98 to 1 in the Senate, 356 to 66 in the House, resembled uh, the model of the uh, German uh, uh Gazettes in the early 30s. All of this predicated on the emergency, uh, a doctrine of emergency, and the doctrine of emergency becoming um, uh, more and more of a normal of a normal feature. Uh, whether that whether we will um, see a slow winding down, we may find less and less practice, but we will certainly will not find uh, the abandonment of of uh, the gains in rule through law uh, that uh, Joe adverted to. Uh, secondly. Um, I think what we've seen in academia is a kind of a crisis in so-called human rights scholarship from the naive um, uh, interventionism um, that uh, led so many liberals to support the war in Iraq uh, down through the recent debates, although Samantha Power did get us to, uh, to bomb Libya. So that impulse is not completely in retreat, uh, but when one looks back at the way uh, liberals supported uh, the illusions about what uh, invading and bombing Iraq uh, would accomplish. Um, uh, it's it's quite uh, um, quite uh, remarkable. If I have a couple of minutes, I'll I'll come back to to some of, of the um, some of the things that were uh, cited on on behalf of. Um, from the liberal world on behalf of the invasion. Um, thirdly, a very substantial transformation in the field of immigration scholarship. Uh, immigration scholarship, which was for decades pivoted around mercantilist issues, 
brain drain, getting the world's uh, um, best, quote, people to come to the United States, reuniting families, doing a kind of cost-benefit calculation of what would be good for the economy, for, for uh, the community, et cetera, that mercantilist uh, vision has, is largely left the field and has been replaced by something many of us call crimigration. The conflation of criminal law with immigration law, first and foremost around the issue of security, border controls, uh, IDs, enhancing police powers, whether uh, in the explosion of state level initiatives, Arizona, Georgia, uh, rafts of others, uh, the um, expansion of the E-Verify program, which would create this National Register of Employment. Uh, you know, the same people who talk about government regulation destroying jobs are prepared to expand in this area relentlessly. Um, um, so uh, we've seen, uh, and I don't want to take the time to go through the, the parade of horribles that we all know about, the tensions that the courts have upheld as, as not requiring even the revealing of names, uh, the D.C. Circuit's famous opinion of the Freedom of Information Act did not require revealing the names of people who had been detained extensively without cause. Uh, I, I, I really swore I would avoid the parade of horribles here. But um, we know about them, and um, uh, they have raised for the field of immigration law uh, a range of questions uh, that had also been considered settled for a long time, for example. Uh, the value of the surplus of being a citizen as opposed to a mere resident uh, was declining with the expansion of constitutional due process protections uh, and the like. Uh, the difference between a permanent resident and a citizen was reduced to jury duty, voting, higher civil service positions, a few things more or less at the margins, naturalization rates for some communities, Mexican Americans, for example, uh, immigrants were down to the 30s, in the 30s, eligible naturalizations. And this has um, dramatically changed uh, as uh, people sense that who you are, where you are, who wants to or has apprehended you is suddenly an issue that makes citizenship mean more. So all the globalization blah blah about how your gold card meant more than your green card and the cosmopolitan elites. The elites are still, oh, elites always have been highly cosmopolitan, but the, the uh, sense of vulnerability, 400,000 deportations and rising annually, the, um, um, the truncation of due process in the entire world of immigration, the fact that now immigration authorities are not only at the border, but the border has been moved abroad some of you may have seen this flying to Canada, Ireland, elsewhere, that U.S. immigration authorities are already there, and uh, you confront them before you even get to the border. And those of you who are foreign students or foreign residents know that even if you come from a country that was once a visa waiver country, you still now, again, have to uh, do as much with the visa waiver as you used to have to do to get a visa. So the, the crimigration, uh, the evolution of immigration law into crimigration law, uh, even, even leaving aside uh, the, um, um, the uh, prerogative, the Frankel issues of detentions and calling people in and then having them appear voluntarily and arresting them and detaining them, deporting them. Um, uh, it's, now, it's now clear that immigration law is going to become increasingly seen from the aspect, through the aspect of security as a form of criminal law, which of course makes those who haven't got every I dotted and T crossed into criminals. So uh, it has always been, for example, a criminal act to enter the country illegally, but never has the uh, government prosecuted on that basis independently. Uh, because, as a criminal prosecution would require the whole panoply of defendants' rights, representation, et cetera, whereas a civil procedure of, of deporting someone does not, I don't want to get too detailed, but 
uh, we're seeing a conflation of, of the civil and criminal throughout the immigration context, which bodes ill for everyone. And um, fourthly, um, and, and here uh, I tread lightly, but since I'm on our recruitment committee this year again, I, I do have some data for this. Um, we're seeing a second wave of identity politics. We're seeing a second wave of escapism, I would call it as a crude materialist myself. Um, we're seeing uh, progressive energies in young scholars dissipated in um, the aesthetic frivolity uh, which some forms of postmodernism have turned into uh, legitimate uh, uh, life as amusing irony. And um, uh, there is some, um, I hope I haven't offended it. Well, actually, I hope I have. But anyway, um, uh, I'm sure I have. Now I hope I have. I'm sure I have. Um, but um, uh, this, is, this is a retreat from the confrontations with power. We're not all capable of being litigators or, or legislators or the rest. Many of us are just plain academics. But um, uh, one form uh, of backing away, whether it's you know the the uh, d uh, the trends that one saw in history or anthropology or other fields during the 50s and and similar periods to um, retreat from the social into the um, personal versions of the discipline uh, that has been the, the fourth uh, uh, turn. Uh, well, Four or five more minutes. Do I? I'll take. I'll. I'll make it two. Um, the um, the the anxieties, and and this is a little bit different from the fifties and sixties. The consistent growth rate of the American economy, the certainty that. Um, whatever you thought of, of communism, you'd get a job, right? Because the American economy's uh, growth during the 30 glorious years, as the Europeans call them, uh, after World War II, um, uh, permitted uh, a certain ch risk taking, a certain chance taking. What I have to say is someone who's been a professor now for almost 35 years is, uh, is the, the, the fear of risk, the fear of unemployment, the fear of hundreds of thousands of dollars of indebtedness between oneself and one's parents. Um, that's a form of factual, apolitical, quote unquote, um, repression as well. Uh, the concern that, um, well, we have to grade this course, I have to get my ranking class, I gotta be in the top X percent. Uh, also part of the talk today about grading and organizing and rationalizing the educational production process is a response to scarcity, to new forms of scarcity. And scarcity has never been uh, the friend of either uh, liberality, uh, or tolerance, or, or um, risk taking um, and it, it is um, uh, there's a side of Carl Schmidt let me close with that instead of looking for uh, human rights quotations uh, that um, uh, that was ignored in the discussion of uh, the Hobbesian Schmidt the Bushian Schmidt um, namely that there's another there's another line that's traced from from Schmidt and that's the line that goes via Hayek and von Mies and Popper and Friedman to the neoliberalism of Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan, and, and Bush as well. Uh, the, the, for all of what we associate with Schmidt, Schmidt as the powerful state, Schmidt at the same time in all of his acolytes and students stood for, uh, in his phrase, the healthy economy in the strong state. Uh, and for a process of destating the economy, works in German, doesn't work in English, and Staatlichung der Wirtschaft, getting government out of the economy, we would say. 
So the same process of, of uh, kind of neo-Hobbesian tough domestic sovereignty in a world that consists of friends and foes has as its logical and biographical uh, descendant um, the neoliberal market economy of responsibilization. Everybody's on their own. Everybody takes care of themselves. It's a precarious world, right? The Germans now have this new world. French and Germans now have this new word, the, the precariat, those whose lives are, will, and will always remain precarious in terms of employment, in terms of security, et cetera. Though that is another aspect of that same uh, uh, Schmidtian uh, world and uh, philosophy, and it's visible not only in all the acts of repression that we've talked about, but all the aspects of self-silencing and uh, aversion to to uh, challenge and conflict that weigh so heavily on our universities right now. Thank you. I want to uh, thank our panelists very much for their insightful comments. Um, I, I had a question just sort of relating, and I think all of you touched on it in some way, but, but Joe in particular, you're, you're ending with your, your, your less than sanguine uh, hopes about, about the future. Um, to what extent, um, this is a question though for you all, um, do you feel that the academy, the legal academy, legal advocates, um, in their response to uh, the overreaching, perhaps, of power, assertions of power, um, either failed or made mistakes in both uh, speaking of law, perhaps just speaking of law and not something else, speaking of law in, in abstraction rather than perhaps in more concrete or uh, individual terms, substantive rights. Um, and then also, I think what what has been adverted to here is, is, is a certain romanticism of, of a pre-9-11 era uh, that, you know, oh, you know, before 9-11, you know, never were such actions taken uh, and, and an ignoring of, of you know, crimes or, or flaws in, in our criminal justice system and in our foreign policy. Uh, anyone would like to take that? You have pride of place, so go ahead. <laughs> well, you know, it, the advocates of lessening the rule of law in order to unchain the United States in its combat against the terrorists were not just people that were in the government. They were also in academia. And some of them were in both places. So for example, Jack Goldsmith wrote a book after he had been in the government and he advised the president to ignore international law because he said that international law wasn't binding. He got out of the government and he wrote a book to convince all the elites and academics that for in perpetuity, that's the way it should be. And this book is called The Limits of International Law. One of the things that we did from a very practical point of view is in order to take that on, not just on the metaphysical level or the theoretical level, is we assembled all 10 of the living State Department legal advisors. And we got Carnegie to give us a grant. We did it in Washington, D.C. And we asked them, look, you guys have been around for 30 years. You've seen international law in action. You've seen crises, not just the 9-11, but there have been crises in the past. Um, is it true what Goldsmith says, that the policymakers don't think international law is real and that we shouldn't consider international law as real? We produced a book that's now been published by Cambridge University Press, which I hope is the anecdote to what Goldsmith tried to achieve through his book, which shows that at least within the State Department legal advice, which <laughs> is an important part of interpreting international law within a government that has many different experts in different uh, bureaus and agencies like the Justice Department, Defense Department, White House. But those people at the State Department believe that international law is real law. They have said that they have had a very good track record of convincing presidents to forego foreign policy preferences in order to do what's legal. That often we don't know what's going on behind the black box, but they are considering all sorts of crazy things and these lawyers in the government have convinced them, no, we're better off to stay within the law and there are huge consequences for us if we don't. 
And I think the sad part of the White House torture memos was that there was a cabal of lawyers, including uh, John Yu, um, Addington, Haynes, Gonzalez, who by using extra classifications beyond top secret were able to keep the State Department legal advisors from the table. And so the president didn't get to hear that view. He didn't get to hear what the consequences were going to be. And this has happened, according to the legal advisors, on three other occasions in history, which is not a lot. But there are occasions you might you know, think everybody would think about. For example, the, the uh, mining of the Nicaragua harbors. And they said, when this happens, it's always a train wreck. And so you know, one of the things, I guess, in, in response to you, I, I, I challenge your um, assumption. I think that from a very practical point of view, not just metaphysical or theoretical, uh, the law does matter, even in times of crisis. And it's important for those who believe that to stand up for those who are trying to advocate the opposite view, even when we're fighting against terrorism. I, I would just say, you know, the, the, Bob, uh, the, the packet you have, you know, the, 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 the one that has the um, uh, program in it, uh, I don't know why I did this, but at the end of it is a, is a reprint of my article uh, called Terrorizing Academia that I wrote with Hope Metcalf at Yale. Uh, that is my take on that. And bottom line is, I, legal academics certainly uh, over reified the idea of law and missed out on uh, the political component of understanding how all this, in fact, operates. Um, well, I had one, a comment and a question, but now I have two. The, an explanation. The reason that piece is in there is because the state of Ohio bar. Uh, for purposes of CLE requires that oh. we include some materials. So it has nothing to do with the fact you like it. It's, 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 uh, it, it was the best because we all sent something. In oh, okay. Thing. The invitation had something to do right. with it. The, the article got me a trip right. to Cleveland. Um, I, I wanted to, to um, the comment is that uh, the word lawfare itself has a similar history to the one that you, you've traced. Uh, before Colonel Dunlap uses, uses it, I've found at least one instance of an anthropologist using it. And the, the term is used as what states do to indigenous people. Oh, um, so it's the use of law by the state against other people. And in fact, um, apparently there is some similar phrase uh, from it used in 19th century South Africa, which translates to the warfare of the British, which was law. Um, so this is um, this capture is uh, is you know a common common theme. But I want to ask you about that. And since this is this is the panel where we go into confessional mode. Um, I'll tell you a story about myself. This is prompted by Joe's comments, but it's for the panel as a whole. Um, when I left the safe haven of my Marxist graduate program uh, to go to law school, um, was I, was very, I was very skeptical about what I was doing and very uncertain. Um, and one semester down, I remained skeptical and, and uncertain. And over the break, I picked up Wigs and Hunters and read what is one of the most depressing books imaginable because it <coughs> describes 18th century England, which I, I think it's Peter Leinbaugh has referred to it as a thanatocracy, uh, a government that is structured around either handing out or withholding sentences of death. It is a horribly depressing book. And then at the very end of the book, E.P. Thompson has this wonderful moment where he talks about, but out of all of this comes the rule of law as a weapon of the downtrodden. And it is like the experience of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, where in the last movement, the joy of C major finally conquers the gloom and despair of C minor. And that was my experience. It was OK, probably OK for me to stay in law school. Um, I think that the rule of law notion remains contested. Um, you used it yourself as an advocate. Um, and I, 
I guess what I'm asking is, um, is, this, is this a concept and an idea that uh, simply had the power to save one despairing law student? Or is there reason to think that if the battle is going to be won, it's going to be won on the, the, that contest? about the meaning of and the application of the rule of law? Um, oh, well, that's an easy question. Uh, so my, the, uh, I, I started out my thoughts with, by saying that, that, that I'm, I'm, I'm writing this book on sort of the effect of 9-11 of on, on national, on what I take to be national identity. And what I mean by that is, I think national identity is the expression of our shared value. Our, we, there, are, there are a core set of values that Americans, when asked, will say, what does it mean to be an American? It means, and what we know is that those values, in fact, take on different form over time. They're contested, they're not static. So we use the same words to describe very different things. Liberty means something different. Freedom means something different. The rule of law means something different. Uh, equality means something different. The state means something different. Limited government means something different. And what you construct out of all those different meanings is your identity at that time. And it changes and it shifts. And it is constantly being constructed. And so Bill Clinton said in his first uh, inaugural address, each generation of Americans has to define what it means to be an American. And he was right. He probably didn't mean it in the way he meant. He, he, he probably might have thought it was just a throwaway line. But you, you, it, there's a constant struggle. And we are in that struggle to define what our identity is. And I, one of the, an article that I'm working on now is, you know, uh, is, uh, I, I confront the sort of the nihilism question, right? I mean, is there any sort of foundational, can you construct anything? Can you construct anything? And the reason I came to this, Bob, is, is that, Hell, if you can construct a, 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 a value-laden uh, justification for torture, then, I don't know, maybe you can construct anything. Is there any there there? Um, and so I, I, I think the struggle does go on. And uh, I, all I know is that we have to, we are in a time and a place where it is easy, it is not the only, but it is easy to invoke an understanding of the rule of law, which means control of the other. That's what the rule of law is. We use the law to control the other. And then it's just a matter of defining who the other is. As long as that predominates, it's, it, it, is, it, it, it represents a potent, potent force that pushes back against, no, the rule of law is the restraint on the state. And those two things are struggling mightily. And the winner of that will determine what national identity looks like in the next 20 or 30 years. If I can add something to that. Um, largely overlapping with what you said. I mean, Thompson praises the rule of law for two reasons, right, in that essay. One is that uh, it serves to tie the hands of the elites themselves. They have to live up to their ideology, at least to some extent, so it ties their hands. And the second, that it provides a terrain for those who are not well armed with muskets uh, to fight. Uh, so, uh, it becomes an empirical question, you know, whether the terrain is available or not available to people to fight. Obviously, if we look at the contemporary American scene, uh, there are lots of politicians who think there is too much law there for people to fight. Look at the attack on the National Labor Relations Board, for example. You know, is uh, it clearly indicates that some people think that the law gives workers a place to fight that they shouldn't have. Um, the question of whether it can also consistently constrains the powerful, you know, also becomes an empirical question. On the one hand, they didn't call in the State Department lawyers because they knew they'd give them trouble uh, using the law for, uh, to advance their project. And let me just add a very concrete example of what you're saying. Before 9-11, there were surveys that asked Americans, did you think that you would ever approve of, of torture uh, to stop a ticking time bomb type of situation. And most Americans said, no, torture should never, ever be used before 9-11. Now, Dick Ch Cheney worked very hard to change the American people's uh, perception of that. 
And even after he was no longer vice president, when they finally assassinated and killed Osama bin Laden, he went on the national press speaking tour and said, that was only possible because we waterboarded. You see, we had to do the torture to stop Osama. And thank goodness for Senator McCain, because he did an op-ed in the Washington Post where he said, look, we got to tell the truth about this. The CIA has confirmed that the information that led to Osama bin Laden did not come from waterboarding. So don't believe anything that you're hearing to the contrary. And if he hadn't said that, I would think that these surveys of Americans, which are now showing that most Americans favor torture in the war on terror, would have continued to, to go. And this is really where the rubber meets the road. This is where the war is being fought. It's, it's over the American perceptions. And you could see in 10 years how far we've come as a country from a country that says it is not us as Americans who would ever condone torture to a country where we're very comfortable with torture. And we would be even more comfortable if we had believed that torture led to the killing of the terrorist mastermind of 9-11. And I think that Senator McCain put the brakes on that project. But this is where the battle is being fought today. Yeah, I mean, I, I would only note, and again, maybe to push back a little on still you know, the, the elements of law and other factors that, that play out here. Uh, there was a TV show that was supposed to yeah. debut right at the time of 9-11, and it was postponed a bit. The show was called 24, yeah. right? Yeah. And that was, you know, so there was something within the cultural zeitgeist, right, you know, that was there at the time of 9-11, pre-9-11, and has pervaded, uh, I might submit, irrespective of the Dick Cheney's of the world, um, that was ready to suggest that in the name of national security, torture, torture is worthwhile. And, uh, and, and wants to see you know, that perfect narrative. Yeah. I mean, I, mean, I wonder, it's well. chicken and the egg, because they didn't do the entire season of 24 before 9-11. They only had the pilot. Right. Um, and in fact, I believe that as things were changing on the ground, 24 was reflecting it. And most scary of all, when they did surveys of people in the military, especially those that were in Guantanamo Bay um, and in Abu Ghraib, they said, yeah, we love watching uh, 24. It's our favorite show. And, and that really is a concern. Yeah. Do you want to? No, I, I, I mostly I think questions. Oh, are, please. Yeah. Since most of today's uh, presentations have been discussing kind of that clash between ethos and morality. And if you mentioned the change of people saying they would accept torture when they normally wouldn't have been, would that mean that the realm of the, our, this kind of discussion in the academia and the legal academics in particular should be exploring why these movements move back and forth. Because it's not always cultural, it's how we feel about ourselves in a kind of world view, as we may say. So the question here is, can we latch on to the core ethical standards? Well, and then, you know, and then find out where the fudge room is because the, I, I see those as sliding plates and they don't always line up. So, I, so, so this is, so, I, I mean, this is why I was, I'm so happy to be here because this, and I really, I feel like I'm being unfair because this is just sort of like a long brainstorming session about my book and I'm really, I'm, I'm happy for it. Um, I will declare my own um, sort of methodological bias here. I am a constructivist. And by that I mean, if you flood the public square with one interpretation of a, um, of, a, of an idea and tell people over and over again that this is what the idea means and that that's all people hear and they cannot judge for themselves, that's what people will understand it to mean. It is very difficult. If, it is, if, it is, if it's not something they can assess for themselves, they will take their understanding from what they hear. And if there becomes a dominant hegemonic message, and we can demonstrate this very easily, I've done this over and over and over again. I want to ask, there's a self-selection of the people here, there's the folks who are interested in this topic. How many people in here have an opinion, yay or nay, you think it's a good thing or a bad thing, I don't, I don't care what the opinion is, have an opinion on the Patriot Act? Have just, okay, and that's the majority of people. All right. How many people have read the Patriot Act? And you didn't have your opinion, hand up on whether you had an opinion, did you? Oh, okay, okay. One. Two, maybe. I'm not surprised, Michael. <laughs> Obviously, you formed your opinion based on something. And that something is invariably variations of people say. P 
people say. People say, I heard it on NPR, I read a blog, I read a book, I read a, I listened to a, a, an analyst uh, who's a national security expert on. If all those messages are the same thing, that's the battle for the public square. If all those messages are the same thing, that's what you're going to come to believe. And is it, is it, is there any break on what those messages can be? That's what I'm struggling for, with right now. Well, the question suggests that there is. I mean, after 1945, in Germany, there was a, a very strong, uh, in response to the feeling, fear, that the legal system, lawyers, courts, judges, had all surrendered themselves to Nazism because they all followed the law, there was a very strong uh, rebirth of natural law particularly by Catholic uh, uh, writers, but throughout the society, that we needed some place to find grounded core values that could survive the weakness of people in parliaments and on the bench when confronted with power. Um, and then after a while, it faded because we can't agree in a democracy at that level of core values. We can invoke the ones we want, we can uh, endorse Martin Luther King's vision of natural rights, uh, but not of natural law and natural rights, but not Clarence Thomas's, you know. Um, so we're back to democratic processes and trying to uh, establish um, uh, rules that we can all live with. And, and, and I, I, I've actually come, I tentatively come to the conclusion that it's not all nihilism, it's not just everything. I mean, Ann Swidler is a sociologist and she has this concept of the cultural toolkit. And there are some things that are just not part of the cultural toolkit. They might have been once, but they aren't anymore. And at that moment, you just simply can't invoke them to promote a new construction of this set of values. So what do I mean by that? You cannot say, you know what? Jim Crow was a good idea. You can try to create something else, and you can call it, Jim, you can call it something different and, 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 and hope to try to achieve the same result as Jim Crow. But you can't, because it's not part of the cultural toolkit anymore, endorse de jure uh, um, segregation and, and, and differences in treatment. You just can't do it. So things are bounded, but I think they're bounded by cultural terms, not by some sort of, you know, I, I don't think you can prove the, the bounding um, as a logical or an analytic matter. Let me add on, on a note of optimism, because I think we're going down a very pessimistic yeah, that's my, that's my uh, problem. <laughs> sliding scale here. The United Kingdom experienced much of what we did with 9-11 in its battle against the IRA terrorists. And they went and did a lot of the things that we've done with the Diplock courts and you know, using methods that approach terrorism, I mean, approach torture to try to get at the IRA. They have passed that. The pendulum has swung back. Um, the United Kingdom, for the most part, is not calling the struggle against terrorism a war against terrorism. They're not engaging in terror and torture, and they have, have bounced back. I think the pendulum has swung back for them. And I think that if you look at that, you know, right after 9-11, it was like Pearl Harbor. And right after Pearl Harbor, we did a lot of things that we wouldn't ordinarily do about um, with the rule of law. You know, we put Japanese in internment. And um, we had all sorts of laws that were, you know, would have not been acceptable during peacetime. And what I'm suggesting is that as we get more space from 9-11, and as more years go by without a repeat of 9-11, we'll have the breathing space to bring our country to be centered again and bring us back into our core values. And so I don't think we've departed from these values permanently, and I'm hoping that we'll start to swing back, and that's what the next 10 years we'll, we'll see. If there's a question, I'd rather take that. But if I have one minute, can I respond to that? Because I actually think the situation is, is less optimistic than that. Please, that'd be great. Um, the, 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 the fact is, I mean, I've looked at this very, very closely in my attempt to reconstruct this. And if you look at the change in thought, the fact is, if in the, th this is the common understanding. The common understanding is in the eye of the storm, in the moment of, you know, uh, as, as Susan Hirsch says, the, the, the moment of greatest calamity, that's when we lose our way, and as we get farther and farther from that epicenter, the fog lifts, the, the scales fall from your eyes, and you, and you get back to normal, a pre-crisis normal. That's the great myth of deviation and redemption. In fact, however, if you look at it really closely and you reconstruct it really closely, in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, there wasn't this kind of crazy overreaction. 
In fact, um, and just one little demonstration of that, 100 days after 9-11, and even closer than time after the anthrax attacks, when the fear of another attack was palpable, everybody was incredibly freaked, that's when Richard Reed, the shoe bomber, tried to blow up the plane that was coming over. And when that plane landed, and that attack was a, was a, a that threat was a very genuine one. He actually came close to doing what he wanted to do. When he landed, when that plane landed, I have checked every single news source and blog entry and everything I can find. No one suggested anything other than that he should be prosecuted in federal court. Absolutely zero suggestion to the contrary. Uh, nobody had any doubt that he should be read his Miranda warnings. Nobody had any doubt that, that, this, that he should get counsel. That was, that was the construction of the solution. And we all know what happened in December of 2009 when Abdul, Abu, Abdul Muttalib came in and tried to do a less serious thing. That is, there was much less risk that he was actually going to ignite his underwear in that flight over. By that time, a different construction had come to dominate. And then it was impossible, partly because of the anti-Obama backlash. But the fact is, the exact same behavior now was constructed as an abomination to treat that as a criminal law problem and to read the guy's Miranda warnings and to bring him into the civilian court. So you see that kind of difference in, in a lot of things. In the immediate aftermath, for instance, in the torture debate, there was really, there was very little enthusiasm for it for the first two years because there was no elite narrative in support of it. That was constructed afterwards. It's not that we had a steady climb back to our values, I guess it would go this way. It's much more manufactured, and that's what makes it more dangerous. Well, I wouldn't want to be excessively optimistic here, but Tushnet and others who've tried to compare this to the Red Scare of 1919 to 23, to the McCarthy uh, period, it's a much more dialectical situation. I mean, nobody's talked about it yet, but in some ways the period since 9-11 has been a coming out time for Muslim Americans and elsewhere, uh, a very vibrant community life uh, has been recognized and developed. The number of, 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 uh, 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 of people wearing religious dress of various religions has expanded, not contracted. It's, it, uh, the situation is grim, it's but fluid. it moves dialectically. It, it moves dialectically. Thing, different kinds of things happen at the same time, and how this period will be compared to either Red Scare 1 or Red Scare 2, it's too early to tell. Well, on that up and down note, I want to thank our panelists. Um, <laughs>